If you told a younger mad cat in grade school, hey, you're going to make YouTube videos that are literally the one thing you hate doing most, which are book reports. Younger mad cat would have thought you insane. Current day mad cat is looking at this epiphany wondering, where did I go wrong? Welcome to the fourth Inner Sphere lore video. Before we begin, you might notice this video is part one of a three video series. If you've been keeping up with my crisis of faith here on YouTube, you'll know that the recorded script for this video reached five hours long. Ain't nobody got time for that, but some do. Either way, that's not something I do here with videos that long, so I broke this up into three parts that I plan on releasing every two weeks from each other. If you're watching this after the premiere, you really missed out. Be there next time or you get detention. At some point in the series, you might ask, why is this video so detailed? You never followed individual characters like this before, why the change in style? First off, this is not a change in style, you're still getting my Canadian Prairie dry sense of humor, but making sure the necessary information is conveyed correctly. Secondly, until now, there has not been a video topic with characters as prominent as these, let alone having so many books worth of their involvement where previous videos are short snippets and source books. The final reason for this video to be the way it is, is because the clan invasion is just as important as the fall of the Star League, but far more documented. With that settled, let the video commence. Phelan Kell sat in his wolfhound that he called Grinner, overlooking a shallow valley on the planetoid in the rock system, called Sisyphus's Lament. As part of a small detachment of the Kellhound's mercenary company, Phelan and a small team were tasked with taking care of pirates in the Oberon Confederation out in the periphery. The day was August 13th, 3049. Spying a griffin and a locust at long range, something made the hairs on back of Phelan's neck stand up. Why are they running from their handiwork might have been his first thought if allowed the time to think of it. Two pirate mechs were fleeing for their lives as Phelan watched laser fire stab out at the pirate mechs, missiles bombarding the locust as well. What Phelan saw next would only leave him with more questions, as an unknown machine appeared in the narrow rocky pass where the pirate mechs also came from. Phelan would watch his mech's computer, the warbook specifically, do its best to identify the unknown machine. It first identified the unknown as a catapult, then corrected itself to a marauder, as the design shared all key features of both mechs. What's more, the paint scheme did not match any known unit or faction. The unknown mech lashed out with twin lasers at the Locust, setting off an ammo explosion and toppled the mech, crashing headlong into a ferrous rock. More pirate mechs made an appearance, also running from the unknown mech. As a mercenary would, Phelan took the opportunity of the help dealing with the pirates, as the griffin was now accompanied by a rifleman and a panther. However, the unknown mech had friends of its own. Phelan's computer would also do its best at identification, labeling them as Warhammers, but the vague visuals were as far as the comparison went for Phelan. He would issue an open challenge over the radio to the pirate leader in the Griffin. With Phelan's backup coming in now, the 3 versus 3 was even. It was the Griffin's PPC versus Phelan's large laser, the PPC having a range advantage that required Phelan to close the distance to less than 500 meters. In the end, a single pass with his large laser would cripple the griffin completely. Phelan would be confused how his weapon could ruin the mech that easily, but upon his inspection of the metal corpse and a quick glance at the other pirate mechs, they were in similar states of damage. Further than that observation was the accuracy. The damage was focused on the limbs, implying incredible aim and hard-hitting weapons that the unknown mechs possessed. In an eerie show of timing, the three unknown mechs moved in closer though closer was a relative term. Stopping at 900 meters out from Phelan, he watched two large laser beams from the Locust Killer cut through the air and strike at the Pirate Panther at a range of 700 meters, a full 250 meters further than any large laser Phelan knew of. Phelan issued a warning to his team, but by then, the Pirate Rifleman had met its grisly fate at the hands of the two other twin unknown mechs that laced the Pirate full of SRM and autocannon fire. Now just Phelan and his team with the unknown mechs, he knew there was grave trouble. Phelan had to beg his team to get away quickly, but the unknown mechs were far too aggressive and powerful to make it possible. The Locust Killer launched two full arcs of LRMs that ravaged Phelan's teammate, tearing the blackjack in half mid-jump jet, sending the top half of the mech spinning out of control coming to a full stop when the domed head planted itself into a rock. 
Phelan cut right immediately, just in time to see two laser beams slice the air where his mech would have been had he not dodged. Phelan got the only fact he needed from that realization that whoever they are, are not infallible. While the status of his other two lancemates was unknown, Phelan made a last ditch effort as he knew what he would be doing was suicidal. He would broadcast the data his mech got on the unknown mechs to anyone from his team. Phelan made a predictive dodge again as another twin laser attack cut through the air where his mech would have been. Phelan would imagine how hot the mech must be running by now, as by intersphere technological standards, a machine that heavily armed could not possibly be able to stay cool, let alone mount enough armor to be viable. The unknown pilot seemingly had enough of Phelan's spastic movements and aimed the arm-mounted weapon pods wide to box Phelan into a direct line firing arc. Given that the weapons were not pointed in Phelan's direction, he fired his own large laser and medium lasers at the Locust Killer. Phelan was expecting to breach the armor, but his weapons only did a generous scratch. All I'm getting is armor. That's impossible. Any mech hauling that much of an arsenal should have paper-thin armor. It's crazy. What happened next was too fast for even the Wolfhound's computers to handle, as the weapon pods on the Locust Killer converged on Phelan. This time, it wasn't just two large lasers, as Phelan thought. He met the full force of the unknown machine, as the four medium lasers went with the twin larges, striking the Wolfhound dead center all at once, skewering his mech into a doomed state. All Phelan could think of in that moment was what his computer was shouting at him to do. Eject. Victor Steiner Davion, heir apparent to both the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth as the future Archon Prince, celebrates his graduation from the Noggle Ring, an extremely prestigious military academy within the Inner Sphere, specifically on the Lyran capital world of Tharkad. Victor, being a young graduate in a royal family, he is to be as one expected. He wanted to be normal, and also had great expectations to live up to. While out of universe, some may call him a Mary Sue, it is important to note that while he is good at what he does, he is not without his failings. Like in our world, prodigies might excel early but learn over life. Victor would be no different. Graduating at the top of his class at the Noggle Ring, Victor was expecting and desired a frontline posting for military service. As is custom for the Federated Sons, the Davion royal family must have military service to become the first prince. Doubly so with the expectations of also inheriting the Lyran side of the Federated Commonwealth, Victor wanted to establish his reputation with a very loud statement. Meanwhile on New Avalon, a likewise graduation ceremony would be held at the New Avalon Military Academy, or NAMA for short. There, another prodigy would be enjoying some downtime before being deployed is none other than Kai Allard Liao. Son to Justin Allard and Candace Liao, the former being current head of intelligence for Prince Hans Davion, and the latter being the royal family to the Capellan Confederation, though in this instance, Candace Liao led the separatist group known as the St. Ives Compact. Completing a nigh unbeatable scenario, Kai would be among the top cadets at the academy, a feat that unfortunately would have left his at the time girlfriend out of the selection for the Davion Heavy Guards a unit which his girlfriend's family had a long history of serving in. He would make the decision partly for her sake, mostly for his personal demons, to instead pick the 10th Lyran Guards as a unit to serve in. In a tearful breakup where Kai managed to admit his actions were for her well-being, she knew there was more to it, leaving him with these words. 
Well, let me leave you with this, Kai Allard. Somewhere inside of you, you're terribly afraid. I don't know what you have to fear because you're brilliant and hardworking. I'd hoped that together we could conquer your demons, but that's impossible now. By your choice. No matter what, I wish you the best of luck. But mostly I hope you discover what you're afraid of and how to deal with it. Until then, how will you ever truly be happy? To Kai, he would be in pain but feel this was the right decision. As when, not if, he failed. He would do so alone, out on the Lyran side of the inner sphere, hurting only himself. Tyra Miraborg, daughter to the Iron Jarl on Gunsberg, had a fling with Phelan Kell during his stopover on the way out to the deep periphery. The two of them got very close, to the point where Phelan offered a position in the Kell Hounds for the Shylone Aerofighter pilot. However, she felt her place was not with the Kell Hounds despite the very tempting offer, nor was it to remain on Gunsberg with what we would call a toxic father. While not shown to be abusive, Tor Mirborg was always bitterly angry, especially towards mercenaries. The Iron Jarl organized a mugging on Phelan during his stay, which greatly upset Tyra, enough so that she decided to leave Gunsberg and join the first Rosselhog Dracons, the Rosselhog Prince's Royal Guard. With that, she'd leave behind the place she no longer considered her home. Before we get into this next part, I do sincerely apologize for any bad pronunciations of names, titles, etc., as mispronunciations bother me to no end as well. But for the sake of storytelling, I cannot simply do what I did last time by saying, ah, just look at it on screen. So instead of doing that, I'm going to give it a shot. So with that, let's talk about the next couple of characters. All the way over in the Draconis Combine, we meet Tai Shin Yodama, who has just arrived on Turtle Bay, a Draconis periphery world with a paradise-like climate and appearance. Shin is an interesting character as he is a Yakuza, or in a close enough term to English, criminal. Before you lot that are familiar with Japanese culture come to bite my head off, I am presenting this information in a very general way. If you want the 10 hour long breakdown of Korean culture to explain everything perfectly, you have the wrong lore guy. I'm just presenting information enough for people to get the important themes in. Anyways, since Theodore Kratos reforms to the military, Yakuza were able to prove themselves in the military, and Shin more than did that, as the summons to Turtle Bay would soon reflect. Finding out his new station was to be the second in command to Hohiro Kurita, Theodore's son. Sometime later, Shin would be enjoying the evening air and scenery of Edo and Turtle Bay. The world was beautiful as the world was ringed colors of red, purple, and yellow, and the lazy slopes of the land built up into majestic hills and mountains. This world is certainly more beautiful than any other world where I have lived. I hope to never lose my sense of wonder for a sight so magnificent. Despite very angry protests, Victor Steiner Davion would argue with his father, Hans Davion, and Marshal Morgan Hasek Davion about his placement at Trell 1 practically a backwater world towards the Corward periphery, nowhere near the front lines with the Combine. Victor wanted to see any in all action, not a dead posting. After a logical discussion, Hans would help Victor see what he missed. The fact that Hohiro's placement at Turtle Bay, so far away from the Fed Sun's Combine front lines, was a show of silent faith from Theodore Kurita, one that Hans understood perfectly. Hohiro's graduation record was purposely leaked to Hans Davion. The deployment reports Justin Aller also provided showed that Hohiro's unit was doing nothing special, just a regularly armed and supplied unit. Hans gave Victor's reports and file to the Combine in turn, and Hans told Victor that these actions were not a declaration of war, nor was it a non-aggression pact. It was mutual acknowledgement that if conflict should arise between the Combine and the Federated Sons, it would not be Hans Theodore, or Takashi Kurita to do it. It would be left to Victor and Hohiro alone to decide. With that, Victor accepted the placement on Trail 1 with the 12th Donegal Guards. We return to Kai Allard who is now on Scandia in the Isle of Sky region on the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth. It is a quick but notable stop in as we see Kai run his mech, Yen Lo Wang, through its paces on a training course, having spent time being shipped from light years away. Justin Allard, being the former owner of Yen Lo, made his name both personally and for the mech as it was the very heavily customized Centurion that won him the Solarius Championship, a gladiator's arena for mech warriors. Kai would reflect more on his duty, things his father told him, especially about killing. Killing is, ultimately, 
a failure of all other methods to influence and change someone. That it is sometimes the only way to protect yourself does not give it any more sanctity or merit. That would stick with Kai in the years to come. 15th of September, 3049. Primus Middle Waterley of Comstar met with pre-center marshal Anastasius Vogt at the Comstar HQ. For a more fancy and dramatic name, this facility was the first circuit compound located at the Hilton Head area on Terra. This day was Folk's 78th birthday, but any enjoyment of the day would be put to the wayside as the entire first circuit of Comstar was here to meet and discuss the latest information that had caused the Primus concern. Addressing the lesser information first, the circuit debated the veracity of the information they received. What was clear was the fact that the Kelhound spent the sea bills to transmit the information on a high level piqued Comstar's interest. As pirate activity in the Oberon Confederation was common enough that mercenary companies often traded wins with each other, the lack of boasting on the pirate's victory and the tight-lipped Kelhounds led Comstar to believe Phelan had been killed in action. They would then get into the meat of the information. First, Folkt would show a battle mech. What I labeled as the Locust Killer before appeared. It would be here that, because of Phelan's warbook not being able to correctly identify the chassis between the Marauder and Catapult, would folk name the fearsome war machine the Mad Cat. The design made the Primus shiver, an unshakable feeling of dread that the machine evoked, lamenting to herself that it was built to be malevolent. Folk would speak about the known information of the mech's weaponry with pride, Waterly imagining to herself what Comstar could achieve with such powerful machines. See where this is going yet? No? Alright, I'll keep going. Arrogantly, the Primus, who is not a mech warrior or has intimate knowledge of how mechs work, suggested that she would order Comstar's catapults be retrofitted to copy the Mad Cat. Folkt would correct her with silent annoyance, stating that arming a mech like that would leave it woefully under-armored, and if they were to match the armor and weapons, the mech would be so heavy as to not be able to move given how typical fusion engines Comstar has worked. The Primus cursed in her thoughts at the reality of superior technology outside of Comstar control. Folk would further add to the list of facts going over the massive increase to weapon ranges, estimating effective ranges to be anywhere from as small as double to 3 to 400% better than Comstar has, as well as the cooling these new mechs would have in order to use their weapons and still operate. In short, Folkt came right out and said that whatever these machines are, are far more advanced than even the Star League of old were capable of making. That left only one question in the Primus's mind. Are they Kerensky's army come back to haunt us? While I am greatly tempted to leave it on that dramatic query, it would be a sin not to mention Folkt's immediate response to it, an important response that would be the go-to answer for most as to identify these new invaders. Folkt would admit the possibility of the Star League Defense Force returning was a strong and popular theory among his advisors. He ultimately would say he believed the unknowns to be aliens mimicking humanity. As to why, he would state the mechs are designs unknown even to the Star League, as the Mad Cat alone was nothing close to anything the Star League had or had planned to make prior to the Exodus, also adding that no scientific personnel were present in the Exodus or at least ones that Comstar was aware of. He would also cite the lack of manufacturing facilities that left with the SLDF, the fact the paint schemes do not match any SLDF unit, and the Comstar Explorer Corps lost the SLDF's trail 130 light years outside of the inner sphere. If I gave you the impression that we had easily ruled out the return of the Star League Defense Forces, I apologize. No, we considered it long and hard before setting it aside. Still, Primus, you should understand that the return is a boogeyman used to explain every unusual group that shows up in the successor states. Wolf's Dragoons, for example, are the latest in a long line of groups tagged as having come from Kerensky, the Black Widow's surname, adding much fuel to that fire. Even so, even if it were true, the Dragoons and all the other groups before them have only had mechs with designs and features that date from the time of the Star League. Folkt then listed off the other possibilities such as a pirate band that happened across some starly cache in the depths of space, lost colonies, but ultimately, Folkt would say he fully believed the invaders are aliens. 
In a self-aware address to the one rule Battletech has, looking at you, Far Country, which is even ignored by CGL and Battletech authors, which is no aliens. However, Folk does give a semi-decent explanation for the mimicry of battle mechs. Citing a far-flung science called conscious genetic manipulation, says that aliens with this ability can adapt and evolve very quickly, basically able to change themselves to adapt to any environment and scenario, and that these beings came across the SLDF and in some eldritch horror-like reality, consumed them, became them, and evolved to become better than them. However, Folk's next couple statements would be chillingly on the mark, with this following conversation between the Primus and himself. You're saying that while they are likely to be bigger, faster, and stronger than us, they will be socially immature? That's too broad a generalization, I think. Coming from a society of warriors, they are likely to be aggressive and militaristic, which is reason enough to respect and fear them. Though discipline bordering on the Draconis Combine's Code of Bushido is very likely, I would also guess that braggadocio, carousing, and gambling will also be seen as nearly sacred. Honor will be everything, which means they will be unprepared for guile in subterfuge. So for now, aliens are piloting alien battle mechs. However, the truth would be far more terrifying. Finally, Folk Volen told himself to go out and meet these aliens as such a gesture of sending the best, arguably, military mind to the inner sphere as a great sign of respect. If the reality of the invaders was more mundane, he would say acting as liaison between Comstar and the invaders would be welcomed, allowing Folk to twist the threads to Comstar's favor. In parting words, the Primus and Folk shared this exchange. Precenter, you said there were two possible reasons why the aliens would be coming to the successor states, but you only stated one. What is the second? It's the same reason the Kelhounds never found the bodies of Phelan Kel or the pirates. To maximize their potential, the aliens need more raw material. They are coming here to harvest mankind. While talking about Phelan Kel the first time around, I unintentionally snubbed his importance to the story. So while these are the Inner Sphere chapters, not covering what occurs with him and his own character arc would be negligence on my part. Phelan Kell would awaken at an unknown time later, his last memory was ejecting from his wolfhound. Manhandled into an interrogation room by two massive men that would make bodybuilders green with envy, Phelan would be asked questions as to his identity, his genetic heritage, and information on the Inner Sphere itself. While he would surprise his captors by answering who his mother was by saying Salome Ward Kell, the reason for the surprise would remain veiled to Phelan for a long time. Beyond Phelan's awareness, his interrogators were very skilled and aware that Phelan had extremely important information they needed from him. As such, he would be put through chemically induced interrogations over weeks and months before it was deemed they got everything from him, and they in fact did. The Great House's military status, sizes, mercenary companies, political atmosphere, any and all information Phelan had was pried from his mind by the unknown interrogators. By the time the effects of the chemicals allowed him to realize, Phelan would feel sick at betraying the inner sphere. Catching up with Victor Steiner Davion, it's October 19th, 3049, and he is just settling into his position as Commandant of the 12th Donegal Guards. A knock at his door would stir him out of his thoughts as he would meet Hauptmann Galen Cox, who presented himself as Victor's aide. Just look at this absolutely handsome Chad right here. Get yourself a friend like Galen. Despite saying he did not request one and told the CEO of the unit such, yet Galen was there regardless, as an aide. It would turn out Galen volunteered himself to press the role of aide regardless of official orders as the other officers were understandably wary about yet another hotshot commander that's going to get them all killed. After some honest words between the two, Victor relented after realizing that he and the guards wanted the same thing, respect and security. And Victor saw that accepting Galen was a first step towards earning the respect and trust of his unit. To use a real-world analogy, the two wouldn't know it yet, but they just became best friends. Kai, meanwhile, would be integrating well into the 10th Lyran Guards, and while out on a morning run, would meet Dr. Deirdre Lear, who, when given Kai's full name, had an adverse reaction like one does with a fatal disease. It's okay, Kai. Women do that to me, too. 
Returning to Phelan for a bit, his interrogations finally ended and would be cleared of the drugs and chemicals by an unknown person who came to collect him from his cell. Phelan made a brief half-assed attempt to escape after Clarity returned to his mind, but the unknown very easily handled Phelan's arm before it could cause him pain as a wordless warning of, don't try it. Realizing the state of weakness he was in after however long he had been there, Phelan would relax and made no further attempts. When the lights of his cell came on, he would be met by the sight of a beautiful young girl in standard military drab who had a penchant for speaking her internal thoughts so long as higher ranks were not present. Phelan noted a quip about her complaining that she was ordered to escort Phelan to meet a con, but in his soiled state was in no shape to do so. The girl would lead Phelan through what he thought was a massive dropship to the nearby showers which were also occupied by three other unknowns. One was a massive female that Phelan mentally remarked as an Amazon, a male with an uncannily large head for his body, and another male roughly the same size as Phelan who, also to his surprise, looked very similar to Phelan. In an altercation started by Phelan, noticing the doppelganger had a handmade belt buckle given to him by Tyra Mirborg, Phelan reached for it. The man in a blur got a few hits on Phelan that knocked the wind out of him and left him dazed for a moment, all while spewing venomous words towards Phelan before departing. During the altercations, names were thrown around that Phelan would attach to those individuals. The girl that brought Phelan here was apparently called Rana. The large woman was Avantha. The large-headed one was Karu. And the angry one that hit Phelan was named Vlad. Aside from Vlad, the others treated Phelan in an odd way that made him feel subhuman. Vlad's way was more extreme, Avantha was dismissive, but Rana and Karu were more timid about it like someone who was dealing with the cards they were dealt. Rana and Karu would assist Phelan in getting cleaned up enough to carry through with the meeting, and finally would be led to where the meeting would take place. Throughout the journey there, Phelan would be studying the dropship, the foreign symbols, the way the hallways formed, and remarked that the dropship he was on must be bigger than the largest known. Finally at the door, Phelan noted the symbol painted on it. He remarked its similarities to the Kelhound, the symbol of his family and mercenary company, but the wolf head was snarling, and it had a banner of five stars behind it. The doors parted and a warm voice would welcome them inside the room. A tall and slender middle-aged man would greet Phelan in a lukewarm manner that would verbally poke at Phelan for any interesting reactions. Phelan deemed this man must be the Khan, Rana mentioned, before being further led into the room to meet the Khan's other guest. The other guest would be the last person Phelan would expect to ever see. Greetings, Phelan Kel. It does indeed appear that stories of your death were greatly exaggerated. In the pristine white robes of a high-ranking member of the Order stood Precentor Marshal Anastasius Vogt. Finally, the last introduction would be made as the tall man would identify himself as Alric, Khan of Clan Wolf. Phelan would ask Folk if it were possible to tell his family that he is alive, but Folk delivered the sad news that regardless of Alric's personal feelings or acceptance of such a request, that Folk could not, loosely indicating that there was someone or something even overruling Khan Alric. Alric would tell Phelan that he was captured by an advanced raiding party on a training maneuver, and Vlad had claimed Phelan as capture. Phelan would mentally note that if what he fought were fresh troops, how much more terrifying their full-fledged mech warriors must be. However, as his position as Khan extended him many rights, Ulrich claimed Phelan for himself, finally drawing attention to the white rope cord around his right wrist. Simply speaking, Phelan Kell, you belong to me. It is now 3050, and the clan invasion had begun. Tyra Mirborg, as part of the Dracons, would encounter clan aerospace fighters, though Tyra would not know who exactly, as the invaders were still unknown outside of Phelan's perspective. Just like observations made with the clan battle mechs, clan aerofighters were new, unknown, and a complete wildcard in warfare, as their tactics and abilities were pushing the limits of standard aerofighter use, pulling high-G maneuvers so regularly it looked like common practice. Likewise, Fighting began on Turtle Bay as Shin Yodama encountered a force from a Clan Smoke Jaguar, who issued the coming battle like a ritualistic gamble, a habit the Combine understood very well. However, Yodama and Hohiro Kurita would be among the first to encounter a new type of battlefield unit. What initially showed up as infantry to sensors 
in reality were armored foes in advanced power armor and worked in packs and swarms to take down mechs with ease. These new units were larger than a man but reasonably so with how bulky the armor looked, and what surprised Shin the most was the humanoid armor took shots from some of the heaviest mech mounted weaponry and managed to stand back up. Their grisly purpose came to realization as Shin watched the armored beings climb on a mech with the suit's claws and blast out the cockpit with arm mounted lasers. And now they sought Shin's mech as their next target. Shin would find that he was out of his depth and was forced to eject in a last ditch effort to survive the armored beings crawling on his mech, going as far as to maim one of them that any normal human would be dead by, but to Shin, these beings were completely alien. Not only did they survive dismemberment, they kept coming despite their condition, and any wounds leaked a black goo that did something. In case you are missing my meaning, this event would add to the alien-like nature the Inner Sphere had towards the clans before they became a known quantity. But more importantly, Shin had his first encounter with a clan elemental, and barely survived. 13th of April, 3050, Trell 1 was under attack by Clan Jade Falcon. Victor Steiner Davion and Galen Cox were taking care of a pair of mechs in the Thunder Rift Caverns. In this encounter, two more clan mechs receive Inner Sphere names. Thor, because Victor noted the autocannon and PPC combo as he would put it, Thunder and Lightning. And Galen named another mech, a Loki, for its utterly mad configuration. Since the Inner Sphere names are not the proper names for these mechs, I will use the proper ones as we encounter and learn at the same time. Previously mentioned was a Mad Cat, whose true name is Timberwolf. The real name for Thor is Summoner, and what Galen called a Loki is actually a Hellbringer. Going further back, Phelan Kell encountered a Timberwolf and two Hellbringers at the time of his capture. Anyways, Victor and Galen's mechs would be down to their last shreds of armor by the time they made a decent dent in the two clan mechs. Victor was, well, in a Victor assault mech and Galen was in his Crusader. It would be a surprise to both of them how tough the clan mechs are compared to theirs, but Victor would learn something very important in this encounter. Remove range from the fight, suddenly the people of the Inner Sphere had a solid chance to defeat clan mechs. Also during this encounter, Victor and Galen would realize the technological disparity between the invaders and themselves. With the fighting on Trell quickly swinging into the favor of the Jade Falcons, Victor and Galen were recalled back to base, where Victor would be told by the commanding lieutenant general to leave on a dropship prepared for him and Galen. Victor protested strongly, but in the words of the general, I'll be known as the man who lost Trell 1, there's nothing I can do about that now, but I will not be known as the man who got Hans Davion's heir killed. The general would order Galen to get Victor off planet immediately. Defiant to the last moment, it took Galen knocking Victor out with a punch to the face to get him to leave. Time to talk about the master manipulators once again. If you thought Comstar was shady in the previous video, you'll get a good look at who and why here. During a meeting of the First Circuit on Terra, Primus Mindo Waterly discusses the latest transmission from Folkt, who kept them abreast of the goings-on and how he was making out. Clearly, by now anyone who has met a Kleiner could tell they are human, but even now, Folkt was still unconvinced for whatever reason, as in his message he was vague about the identity of the clans beyond naming Ulrich as Khan, and uh, Leo Showers as Ilkhan. He would confirm the clan's technological and military superiority for himself as Ulrich allowed Folkt to observe general military operations, but noted the clans were still cagey when it came to discussing their ultimate goal. He would say their primary take from Conquered Worlds were slaves, however the clans would call them bondsmen. Folkt would also make known that the clans do not operate together, but are actually rivals working towards a common goal. Medical advances made grievous injuries as bad as paper cuts, but the big pull in the message came last. The clans expressed interest in working with Comstar, though Folkt would be unaware of why, I did mention in my original clan invasion video that the clans respect Comstar for being the descendants of the Star League that remained behind, but that's as far as that respect carried, at least for now. The First Circuit discussed the message in their own way, but I will sum up what revelations were made clear to them. Ulrich was open about admitting the political rivalry, and taking of slaves was interesting to them in a way where your opponent showed them a card in their hand while playing high-stakes poker. 
Next was the revelation of an Ilkhan and the fact that Khan Ulrich had incredible political power despite not being the Ilkhan. The next revelation was that the Ilkhan was using Ulrich's flagship as his own and was in daily communication with his clan in the Combine, which means the clans had their own HBG systems. While one of the precentors felt threatened by potential competition, another precentor made it clear that at least for the time being, the clans present in the Inner Sphere had no interest in the business of interstellar communications beyond military use. The last revelation was the speed at which the clans conquered. They would guess at motives, but not landed anywhere close to the truth, so I won't bother mentioning those theories since they do not carry the plot. While discussing the invasion, it is told that Victor was successfully evacuated and provided the tactical means for the Donegal Guards to wage guerrilla warfare long enough to make the conquest of Trell 1 a pain in the ass for the Jade Falcons. Meanwhile, the fighting on Turtle Bay was bad, as Ohiro Kurita was declared missing in action and believed to be among those captured by Clan Smoke Jaguar. And now for the wicked bitch of the Inner Sphere to say her piece. Primus Mindo Waterly would go on a villainous monologue about how she, and by extension Comstar, would handle the clan threat. She would say that Comstar is in the perfect place to manipulate the clans to achieve the Blessed Blake prophecy, a Star League made by Comstar after the Great Houses had been subdued. Mindo would have Comstar supply the clans with all the information they need, so the clans become reliant on Comstar. So when the clans outlive their usefulness and decimate the Inner Sphere for Comstar, they will suddenly find themselves in the dark. During this time frame, she would hedge that Folked would discover how to defeat the clans by then, so when the ashes settle, Comstar would be the sole power in the Inner Sphere, standing on the ashes of clan and great house alike. If this sounds vaguely familiar, it's because it is. And that whole belief will take an entire era itself, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there, I promise. Speaking of Turtle Bay, we reach the apex of the storyline, and while it may seem like a victory, a great tragedy would occur as a result. Shin Yodama would be assisting in guerrilla warfare himself, as for a time he had been in and out of foxholes and sewers as a small but effective resistance would be making the Smoke Jaguar's efforts to subdue the planet a giant pain. To the point where the conquering warriors of the clan were still on world trying to pacify the planet so that they could move on. A bombing that killed civilians and jaguars would spark an event that angered Shin, as he dragged the resistance member who committed the bombing in belief he was doing good to scout out the surroundings. While hiding in a house, the two of them would watch on in horror as a smoke jaguar mech Shin had called a Daishi, true name Direwolf, and a healthy spattering of elementals approached some houses full of people. They would issue a warning that if the bomber does not come out and confess, that they will destroy and kill the civilians in the houses until confession, or until there's no one left to kill. With a two minute call, Shin forced the bomber to watch the result of his cowardice as the direwolf obliterated the house and civilians fleeing for their lives without remorse. The jaguars would issue another threat, and this time, a Buddhist monk appeared from the other direction and took the blame for the bombing. Unceremoniously, a jaguar elemental would execute the monk immediately, causing the direwolf and the other elementals to depart the area, believing justice was carried out. The bomber would be punished, but not by the jaguars, but by the local Yakuza leader whom Shin seems to have a past with. After said punishment, the Yakuza leader would confirm plans to break Hohiro Kurita out of a max security prison nearby in which Hohiro was being kept. Quickly cutting away to New Avalon, First Prince Hans Davion and Archon Melissa Steiner Davion would be discussing the state of their joined realms, as Justin Aller discovered Comstar was filtering information and communications. Again. Using the fact that Galen's message to his family arrived before Victor's update, and the fact that the data from the worlds near the front line suddenly began to repeat themselves from times past led to the Fedcom knowing more accurately how the invasion was going and where it was happening at. Still slower than Comstar, but faster than everyone else. Lastly, they would discuss the latest information from the Combine, which showed military movements away from the Fed Suns border and towards the clans, leaving the Suns Draconis border woefully undefended. In another time, Hans would have considered exploiting that, but given the previous leaked information, Hans saw the data for what it was. In response, Hans felt a slight bit more secure, 
as he too would order troop movements to meet the clan invaders in his own realm. This would continue the silent truce between the two great houses. Returning to Phelan for a bit, we find him now slightly more included with the goings-on with Clan Wolf, as he is now housed in a bunk room with other bondsmen. It would be constructing an electronic lockpick that would get him into places he shouldn't. It isn't clear what he would do with it, but obviously to his bunkmates, the great benefit of the lockpick was accessing the area where the Bond's women were. I'll leave that one there for now. Rana would come to collect Phelan as Khan Ulrich requested his presence, but after forgetting something important, Rana took Phelan on a detour to her quarters where he would discover she indulged in art and kept a pet called a Surat. Ironically, Surat is also an epithet in the clans, like how we in our culture would use the words like bastard or bitch. Phelan would also share some of his history and find some common ground between clan life and his own understanding, though much of it was a lot to digest. After retrieving an electronic device, Rana would take Phelan to the warship's bridge, more specifically the observation deck for the bridge, to witness how the clans conduct the preliminary ritual to invade planets. After the process was complete, Phelan would ask Rana what he just saw, though again, a lot of it was over his head. He did grasp enough to understand. In a more vulnerable moment, the two of them held hands, though it was almost immediately interrupted by Khan Ulrich and the Precentor Marshal entering the observation room. Phelan would admit he was unsure why Ulrich requested he observe the bidding process the clans use. Ulrich answered. He revealed that there would be a bid between Clan Wolf and Clan Ghostbear for the Rosselhog system, and Ulrich wanted that system badly. Wanting to utilize Phelan's unique military mind and knowledge of the Inner Sphere in general, Ulrich wanted Phelan to help him plan his bidding for Rosselhog to ensure success. With a clinically planned operation, Shin Yodama, with the help of the underground Yakuza group, giving the Jaguars hell on Turtle Bay, Kohiro Kurita would be successfully rescued and whisked off-world back to the safety of Combine-controlled space. However, what occurred as a result of this would be the first sign of corruption within the clans, and it came from none other than the Smoke Jaguars. Something we will touch on later in this video, but to at least reference this properly, excuse the break in continuity of information. Yes, there was a rivalry between the clans, but this was rooted far deeper than anyone else was aware of at the time. See, Clan Wolf by now had shown themselves to be capable of benevolence to conquered worlds, while the other three invading clans struggled in this department, and this was not due to the individual clan cultures. No, this was due to further separation between all of them. There is a concept we will touch on that defines clans as Warden or Crusader clans. Clan Smoke Jaguar at this time was the strongest adherence to the Crusader cause, leaning into the extreme of brutality and forceful suppression of resistance. But what happened when Galaxy Commander Cordera Perez of Clan Smoke Jaguar learned that they had the Creedon heir in captivity without realizing, and lost said VIP? Even other Jaguars were appalled by what happened. Not long after Hohiro left the Turtle Bay system did the Galaxy Commander issue a single order in retaliation. The stiff resistance in losing a VIP was too much for him, and he gave an order not heard of since the early Succession Wars. Prez ordered his warship, called the Sabercat, to glass the city of Edo. In the blink of an eye, naval-class lasers, autocannons, and missiles rained down, evaporating the rivers, disintegrating buildings, and bringing Edo's population to a round number of zero. What remained was a permanent scar on the surface of the idyllic world and would forever haunt the clans and clan smoke jaguar forever. Behind the scenes of the Inner Sphere's knowledge, Prez would be immediately challenged in the aftermath, losing his command in a circle of equals. Beyond this, it is unknown what became of Prez, but even if all the other jaguars were appalled by this, I imagine if Prez survived the trial, he did not live long past that, and most likely had his genetic legacy removed from the eugenics program in the clan. It would not be clear at this time, but the glassing of Edo would mark the Jaguars for death in the future. With the forces of the Federated Commonwealth to counter the clan invasion assembling on Sudeten, Victor Steiner Davion and Hauptmann Galen Cox would meet up with Marshal Morgan Hossack Davion, Lieutenant General Andrew Redburn, Chris and Dan from the Kelhounds, Ariana Winston from the Eridani Light Horse, and Victor would be reunited with Kai Allard. Together, they would pool their tactical minds to come up with a strategy to give Clan Jade Falcon a broken wing. Galen would meet Kai for the first time, as Victor led the introduction by saying Kai is the man death is afraid of. 
Victor would also mention Kai's personal failings of second-guessing himself to no end, but even I have mentioned Kai's personal quirks enough for you to understand the conversations and thoughts these characters are having without directly talking about it. Taking over as Commandant of the 10th Lyran Guards, Victor, Galen, and Kai would begin working on a counter-strategy to dealing with the clans. As Victor obsesses over correcting mistakes, no one can argue that Victor did his homework, and with the help of his friends and comrades, the presented plan was deemed effective. However, at the end of the meeting, the group would learn that Rosselhog was under attack by clan forces, which moved the timetable forwards. So knowing Rosselhog is under attack, let's learn how it came about. As promised, Phelan was given the tools and resources necessary to guarantee a victory for Clan Wolf to take Rosselhog, but he had yet to pitch it to Con Ulrich. With a tense encounter with Bunkmate and the pirate leader he was originally sent to take out on the rock, Kenny Ryan accused Phelan of being a complete traitor to the Inner Sphere, no matter how Phelan rationalized it. But to Phelan, all that mattered to him was his ability to lessen the death and destruction as much as he could, and that was enough for him. Phelan would present the plan to Khan Ulrich, who was pleased with a strong plan for victory. However, Phelan had one very important condition. Phelan asked Ulrich to bid away his warship, the Direwolf, to prevent what happened on Turtle Bay. From happening again, that is. Ulrich said he would never level a world so barbarically, and Phelan knowing enough about Ulrich knew he was telling the truth. But bidding away the Direwolf would ensure Khan Bjorn of Clan Ghostbear, who came from a naval background in the clan, would be unable to use his warship. It was a good point, but Ulrich argued against bidding away the Direwolf since it broke long-established clan tradition. Phelan pressed and reasoned with the Wolfcon, and Ulrich finally relented. But it came at great personal cost to Phelan, and would set his future in place. Phelan wouldn't know it, but making this deal was actually the best thing for him as a person. We will learn why in time, but for now, let us review the exchange. I will do this and I will endure whatever the consequences of such an action are, but only if you will give me something in return. What can I give you? I am your bondsman, you already own me. I have made you privy to military secrets and classified material. To obtain your help, I have made you a severe threat to the invasion and to the clans, so much so that whether I succeed in the bidding or not, I believe the Ilkhan will ask me to destroy you. It would not please me to do so. Phelan would realize what this meant, and to be sure of his choice, he asked one last question. The assault will be as bloodless as possible? Once the world is pacified, you may accompany me on an inspection. That was all Phelan needed to hear to go into this of sound mind. Well bargained and done. I give you my word, as a mechwire, that I will not attempt to escape or communicate what I know to anyone without a directive from you. Before you owned my body, now, you own my soul. In a connective event, it is important to mention that Phelan's old flame, Tyra Miraborg, was present on Rosselhog and was tasked with evacuating a VIP off-world. With Phelan's planning, Kleinwolf made tactical moves to ensure the first Dracons were kept out of the fight, by shadowing the escort group forcing the aerospace wing to stick with their VIP and not fighting the wolves. However, as warriors do, Tyra found an opportunity to score a few hits on the way out, her aerospace wing managing two passes before having to rejoin the escort. After the battle, Phelan walked among Khan Ulrich's entourage, which included the pre-centaur marshal, star colonel Lara who handled the invasion of Rosselhog, Avantha, and Vlad was present as well. They'd walk the ruined city of Reykjavik, the one on Rosselhog, not Terra, and Phelan would feel like the bloodless as possible was nowhere close to the definition, as it looked more like the wolf warriors who fought ignored any thought of consciously avoiding needless destruction. However, Star Colonel Lara would admit openly that no one anticipated the ferocity of the fighting that took place, as the Dracons chose to dig into the city and were hard to uproot, coupled with the warriors wanting to get the battle over with due to the harassment of an aerospace wing earlier in the battle. Yep, that was Mirborg in case you're missing the connection. Phelan could still not accept any excuse due to how much destruction there actually was for such a small holdout of Dracon mechs. Seeking some semblance of humanity from Clan Wolf, Phelan dared ask the Star Colonel how they were handling those displaced by the fighting, to which she answered that they set up shelter in an old administrative building on the other side of the city where refugees could find shelter, food and water provided by Clan Wolf. 
Phelan asked why there were still refugees huddled around a barrel of fire still if they were helping the citizens. It would turn out that the building Klein Wolf was using was used by the Korean ISF and operated before and during the Ronin Wars that led to the formation of the Free Rasahag Republic. But what the ISF did there was a black stain on the people living here. To put this in perspective, it would be akin to the Allies in World War II using Auschwitz as a refugee center. To those that know, of course they would not go there. While distracted with Phelan's outburst as he educated the Kleiners about the situation, a man made his way into the personal space of Khan Ulrich and got as far as tugging on a sleeve, begging for help. While a vast overreaction by our standards, understandably, Vlad roughly tackled and began to assault the man. He'll kill the old man, you have to stop him! Do I? We had a deal, this was supposed to be as bloodless as possible. If it concerns you, then you deal with him. And Phelan did. Phelan had improved his physique ever since coming off his chemical interrogations before, and considered himself just slightly better than before his capture, and it showed. Phelan would expertly handle Vlad, breaking his nose to subdue him, but it didn't end there, as given the fact that Phelan was a bondsman assaulting a true-born clan warrior, Ivantha, the elemental, had stepped in to deal with Phelan, but Phelan was to have none of it, and managed to fight off and defeat the massive woman. It would take a moment after the fact, but Phelan would learn his first real lesson in the way of the clans. He has, my con, been stopped. So he has. Phelan would silently challenge the rest of the clanners in the entourage expecting more resistance, but instead was met with gazes of deep respect, most even bowing their heads in acknowledgement to Phelan before returning to actually watching for threats. Phelan would lament the following revelation. In this martial society, what I have done is nothing short of a miracle. For me to beat another mech warrior is within the realm of possibility because that is what I am. But to beat someone whose area of expertise is hand-to-hand -hand combat, that is special indeed. It doesn't matter to them that she was taken by surprise, it is her error for underestimating me. In their eyes, that does not diminish what they must consider an incredible victory. And he would be right on the money without being told that explicitly. The clan wolf warriors had respect for Phelan where they had none before. Except Vlad, but Vlad is a special kind of asshat. Without missing a beat, Phelan would request leave to take the recently homeless man and his family personally to the refugee shelter the wolves set up. Ulrich would remind Phelan about the planned departure, not as a test of loyalty, as Ulrich already knew what he needed to know about Phelan by this point, where the man genuinely trusted Phelan. Permission granted, Phelan would take the man and his family, as well as the other stragglers, to the shelter. Phelan doing what he did for the civilian by fighting off wolf warriors would be enough for them to go to the shelter and be aided by Clan Wolf until their homes were rebuilt in short order. And yes, Clan Wolf did make good on rebuilding civilian infrastructure in Conquered Worlds, which helped the general consensus of Clan Wolf being the most tolerable of the clans. Phelan would be brooding in the city alone, still feeling shaken about what he saw and had to do just to ensure safety and security to the people of the world, and what more he could have done. He would be joined by Rana, who had been looking for him. The two would share a vulnerable moment with Rana comforting Phelan by telling him that the reality of what he did was the best possible outcome, as any other clan, even Wolf without Phelan, building the battle plans as he did, would have left the state of things far worse than if Phelan didn't help. Without Phelan, there would have been much, much more destruction and death. Rana would also say how much respect he garnered from the other wolves with how he dealt with Vlad and Avantha as he did which only meant Phelan's status within Wolf was rising. Phelan still felt out of place, even confided that he felt like he would be known as the traitor to the Inner Sphere, another Amaris the Usurper. Rana would vehemently dismiss this and go on to describe how Phelan belonged with Clan Wolf, and that he had more than a home with the clan. The two would spend time together, before having to return to Ulrich for departure. I feel so alone. As long as I am here, Phelan Kel, you will never be alone. Relocated to Marshdale, Shin Yodama and Hohiro Kurita would join the Combine forces there for the next assignment, but Shin would receive an unexpected guest, that of Theodore Kurita himself. Theodore would thank Shin for saving his son personally, then the two would discuss the glassing of Ido on Turtle Bay, further talking about the brutality of Clan Smoke Jaguar. In a strategy meeting with the high-ranking Draconis officials in the room, they would realize the clans are indeed capable of producing enough force to take a capital world, specifically Rosselhog falling to Clan Wolf. 
similar to the FedCom side coming up with their own counters to clan forces. The Combine would take a different form of it from Shin's suggestion based off of the experience of witnessing the Smoke Jaguars taking the Monk's confession at face value back on Turtle Bay that led to his execution. The fact the clans did not perceive lying as a possibility would grant a handful of victories before even the Jaguars would catch on. At least, that was the hope. To secure their own victory over a clan force, Shin and Theodore would plan a deceptive battle to screw the Jaguars over on Wolcott by fixing the rosters of the military units to look like fresh green troops out of the academy with no experience, but in reality, would be veteran frontline troops facing the clans. More than that, the tempting bait of hanging Shin and Hohiro in front of their noses as the two people that escaped them on Turtle Bay will be far too tempting for the Jaguars to pass up. How right they were. With the timetable moved up, Victor waited impatiently to hear if his proposed plan was accepted or not. Turns out that Morgan rejected it based on the extent of forces and resources a strike into Jade Falcon territory would take. However, with solid reasoning that was oddly frank coming from Victor, Morgan relented and okayed the plan with some very important amendments considering supplies, personnel, and Victor being personally responsible for every fighting man and woman, as well as the civilians on the targeted world of Twycross, despite not being the operation commander himself. Victor agreed and would get to work with planning the attack on Twycross. However, as Kai's mech, the Yenlo Wang, was still stuck in a logistical backlog, Kai was without a mech. But having a good friend being the heir of two great houses, Victor would not let Kai proceed without a machine and promise something similar to a centurion, since no mech could ever be Yen Lo. Back on the warship Direwolf, Phelan would confide in a friend he made with another bondsman named Griff, explaining that while his relationship with Rana was good, something else seemed to be tugging her in a different direction, making the whole situation feel off. Sharing some words of wisdom and reflecting on the strangeness of Clannis in general, Griff would depart the bunk room with Phelan's lockpick after saying he and some others were going to get revenge on Vlad for giving them extra work. When they returned in a panicked rush, however, Phelan knew something went wrong, and after malicious goading from Kenny Ryan, Phelan would realize what happened. Was Griff broke into Vlad's room while he was there, but wasn't alone. He was with Rana in an intimate way. Given that Phelan was still operating on inner sphere understandings of relationships, he wouldn't understand the why of a scenario and didn't occur to him things would be different with the clans. Vlad would come into the bunk room and demand that whoever broke into his room confess at the end of an electro whip. Phelan, not in any sense of taking the high road but one out of defeat and pain, would accept responsibility. Even Vlad, for all his hate towards Phelan, knew he was lying and kept questioning why Phelan was covering for the others. Either explanation to Vlad didn't matter, as Phelan wouldn't relent and would accept the whipping from Vlad, even without saying who actually broke into his room. Back on Terra, Primus Mundo Waterley and the First Circuit would be re-evaluating their relationship with the clans after discussing the events of Turtle Bay. The First Circuit would obviously be concerned and worried about further cooperation, but the Primus would spin the events to her favor and secure the agreement for Comstar to continue working with the clans. Primary reasons for it came down to the fact that the clans have since bid away warship assets from use. The pace of their invasion waves has slowed by more than half, except Clan Wolf who is conducting themselves very well, and the fact that clan forces were still numerically stronger than anyone had available to effectively counter at the time. While there was a moment where the pre-centers wished to pass along information of the clans to the Combine and Fedcom forces preparing counterattacks, the Primus snuffed that idea in short order, as it was still Waterley's priority to use the clans to shift the geopolitical climate enough for Comstar to make their move. After the savage beating Vlad gave Phelan, the encounter he knew was inevitable with Rana left both of them rather confused. In Phelan's world, intimacy comes with a silent agreement of exclusivity, but Phelan's next guest would set the tone Phelan had with Rana moving forward. Folkt would visit Phelan in the med bay some time later, and Phelan would learn that Folkt purposely did not read Phelan's file and went as far as to delete the incident that led to Phelan's expulsion from the Noggle Ring, the same file that he would pass on to Con Ulrich. Phelan would tell the tale openly, one I discussed in the last video, but in short, Phelan heard of young kids trapped by an avalanche and took a mech out without clearance to go rescue them. Some deaths occurred from the lack of medical supplies he took with him, but without his help, more would have occurred. Even that would not save Phelan from the cadet honor board, who would move to have him expelled. 
More importantly, Vogt would say he came at the request of Ulrich, who would have come himself, but given the situation between Phelan and Rana, thought it best that someone also from the Inner Sphere make a pass to explain the quirks of clan relationships. Phelan didn't want to hear it at first, but Vogt would press the explanation. In short, clan interactions such as coupling do not carry the emotional weight that it would for you and I, and such actions are signs of friendship. I won't mince words, yes, it sounds weird to us, but when a society is built with these norms and standards, anything else is alien in nature. Strange. Outlandish. How we see these clanisms is how the clans would see us, and more specifically, Phelan's reaction to Rana being with Vlad like that. It would take a couple mental gymnastics for Phelan to entertain the concepts Vogt was telling him about the clan warrior culture, but the largest bombshell would hit Phelan hard enough to understand. Love in clan culture is the exception, not the rule, and because love is such an estranged concept to warriors, they talk to those who they've known since childhood, their Sipko, and Vlad was part of that. Phelan now realized Rana went to Vlad to talk about how she was falling in love with Phelan. The main events for the first act are now coming, as we rejoin the Fedcom forces that landed on Twycross successfully. To recap, the Fedcom forces launched this counterattack to target a world already occupied by Clan Jade Falcon, since predicting their targets is next to impossible. The strike would be significant enough for frontline Falcon forces to withdraw from the front and be forced to hunt down Victor and his ilk to recapture the world. Setting up his forces, which were significant in number in multiple prongs of mech lines, Victor had his forces set up over a significant amount of land, hoping all his efforts would lead the Falcon forces into a meat grinder. But it would not be that easy. Victor would calm around to the various parts of his unit, ending with Kai, who was running around with his lance and a hatchet man, who Victor detached to check on the Great Gash region to confirm Falcon movement. As the engagements between the Kelhounds and Falcons began in favor of Kel victory, an urgent comm message came in to evacuate Twycross immediately, as garrison forces were not present on the planet. In fact, Falcon frontline forces were, and were in numbers that matched Victor's forces, and this included the legendary Falcon Guard, who were moving in on the Great Gash, a place Victor had no contact with. Kai would reach the gash to a sorry situation as the evacuation of a field hospital had not even begun when it was ordered to occur some time before. After dealing with a small team of elementals, Kai would come to find that Dr. Lear was leading the field hospital, and due to the oncoming threat, Lear had to board Kai's hatchet man for the duration of the coming fight. Kai would send a pair of men up to the top of the gash to set off explosives that were set inside the cliff walls. However, those men would be killed by elementals that would appear sometime later. After Dr. Lear boarded the hatchet man, she'd finally realize it was Kai, and they had a not you again moment. But focus on the conversation was put to the wayside as enemy fire from more elementals caused the two of them to be stuck together for the moment, as Kai had to deal with the threats. However, his mech sensors were lighting up with multiple signatures, larger than a lance by far. Kai would order his lance to provide cover and evacuate everyone immediately, regardless of preparation. Kai would move further into the gash, he and Lear would be met, with an entire cluster of Jade Falcon mechs marching in formation into the Great Gash. Kai would silently curse his false stupidity for risking Dr. Lear's life by taking her aboard into such heavy combat, but his reality would squeeze a bit harder as the troops he sent up to detonate the explosives would be thrown down into the canyon by elementals who had slain them, leaving Kai and Lear on their own against an entire cluster. Left with just one option, he would order Lear to remove the safeties that governed the fusion heart of the hatchet man and detonate the reactor. This, he hoped, would set off the sensitive explosions laced throughout the canyon walls. Kai, to buy time and lure the falcons in closer, issued a challenge to the invaders. I am Kai Allard Liao. I am a killer of men. This pass is mine to ward. I offer those who wish to challenge me a warrior's death, but I beg an indulgence of those who would accept my offer. Your smaller companions have forced me to exhaust my autocannon ammunition, and they destroyed one of my lasers. I have only this club with which to defend myself. I will kill you all, alone, or in groups. I am Star Colonel Adler Malthus in command of the Falcon Guards. We salute you, Kai Allard Liao, and assure you that your bravery will live long in the hearts and minds of your conquerors. In a rare showing of melee combat among the clans, Malthus's summoner would engage Kai in an honor duel. However, Kai would eject before any blow by the clanner could be made. 
the full head ejection system of the hatchet man carrying Kai and Deirdre up and away as the reactor of the hatchet man went critical, an explosion enough to touch off the explosives laced in the great gash, imploding the planetary scar and buried the whole column of Jade Falcons under rubble. Because of the lack of communication with the Great Gash, the FedCom forces scrambled all they could afford and a little bit more to meet the Falcon forces in the area and save Kai, even moving to send dropships for heavy fire support. On the way there, Victor and Galen would encounter heavy fighting, only to find the Falcons suddenly fading back, and Victor realized that the forces said to be moving on the Great Gash had not appeared for the killing blow. To Victor's surprise, however, was how the defeated Falcons in FedCom custody were behaving, mostly asking after what clan defeated us and that we owe allegiance to. Victor would make important notes to treat the Falcons favorably, out of a gesture of not knowing if or when the tables turned to garner some semblance of good faith. The willingness to integrate by the Falcons, however, would impact Victor in the long game when dealing with the clans as a whole. Search and Rescue would return Kai and Dr. Lear back to base, where Kai would be in a sullen, regretful mood, announcing that he was resigning his commission. Victor countered by saying Kai took on a whole army alone and won, and the medals earned from that alone can make him a jacket. But Kai is Kai, and would continue to be hard on himself, declaring his failures of sending people to their deaths to set off explosives, and endangering Dr. Lear as reasons enough. Victor would tell Galen to take Kai to medical and come down off of the battle, moving the discussion for later. Victor would keep Lear back, who became blunt with her, out of care for his friend as to why Lear hates Kai. In short, Lear would say all she had to. Let me ask you this, Highness. How might you expect me to feel about the son of the man who murdered my father? We will return to the conclusion of that story thread later. As for the Combine's counterattack, it happened to be much more simple. Where Victor prefers a hammer to strike his foes, the Combine preferred the scalpel. Konnichiwa, Smoke Jaguars. I am Ohiro Kurita, Supreme Commander of the Forces Defending Wolcott. I learned something of your customs while enjoying your hospitality on Turtle Bay, as did my aide, who assisted my escape from that world. To show that we are not total barbarians, I ask you how much force you intend to use in this attack so I may decide which of my resources I shall devote to repulsing your attack. I am Galaxy Commander Dieter Ozis. I fear you have drawn incorrect conclusions from your observations of us, Hohiro Kurita. We have come to take the planet and make it our own and so we do not require you to bargain away your strength. Come now, Galaxy Commander. You know that things could get nasty down here. I must of course defend this world against you, but I don't wish to lose more men than is absolutely necessary. As a fellow warrior, you can understand that. I desire to know how much force you will use in your attack so I can allocate my forces accordingly. Are you saying you will not commit everything you have in defense of Wolcott? Are you willing to use only part of your forces in a battle to decide who will own this world? I see that you understand my proposition. I will, as has been our custom, forward you the service records and history of my units. It will not take you long to see that I have cobbled them together from the dregs of our society. Mind you, they have all volunteered to serve, but bold heart alone does not a mech warrior make. Yes, I am prepared to only use part of my forces to defend Wolcott provided the details can be worked out. The galaxy commander demanded elaboration. Ohiro mentioned that should the jaguars win, they would get the world. But if Karita won, what would he get? The galaxy commander offered no attempts to reconquer the world should he win, but given the jaguars hardly believed that they would lose, so this was a non-issue. Ohiro would respond with appreciation, but given the fact that Ozis may or may not survive, left him to question if the rest of the Jaguars would abide by the outcome, given that Turtle Bay happened. Ohiro wanted something more real. Instead, he would ask for four clan mechs and twelve suits of elemental armor. As you might expect, Oza saw the request as preposterous, but in further manipulation, Ohiro said he needed a good reason to explain failure to his superiors when he escapes the Jaguars again, as a gamble for clan equipment would be reason enough. After a long pause, Ozis would agree to the terms, and Wolcott would remain in Kurita control should Ozis see defeat. Ozis would also declare the forces he would use would be half of whatever Hohiro would bring to the field. As a final jab, Hohiro would leave Ozis with these words. It is such a pleasure to deal with such a reasonable and honorable man. And, Commander, don't worry. If you survive a defeat, I will treat you better than your people treated me. 
and such, the battle would take place, but the cards were massively stacked against the Jaguars the moment they accepted. With many forms of visual and non-visual camouflage, the Combine forces awaited the Jaguars to enter their trap. After a show off display on the part of the dropship pilots hovering 10 meters off the ground, while uncountable tons of machines jumped off the vessel. The fighting began, and it was clear the Jaguars were well out of their depth and succumbed to the Combine's deception perfectly, where suddenly the Jaguars disengaged and stood down, their mechs bringing their weapons to the sky in a gesture similar to infantrymen returning their rifle to the sling. What the Combine called a Ryokan, clan named Stormcrow, moved out in front of the other Jaguar mechs and opened a comm channel. I am Galaxy Commander Dieter Ozis. I freely admit my responsibility in this defeat and absolve my command of any implication of wrongdoing. I salute you, Hohiro Kurita, and your forces. You chose the time, place, and nature of your meeting. I see now I was defeated before a shot was ever fired. Do what must be done, and you can claim your prize. Ozus would exit the cockpit of his mech and step out onto its face, and call out to the Combine forces again, but Shin and Hohiro were confused as to what he expected or wanted. As given Japanese culture, both of them were wondering if Ozus was expecting a ritual seppuku. Shin would be stirred by the hopelessness of Ozus' voice, like a man completely defeated and stripped of value. Still no response came to Ozus as Shin and Hohiro could only guess at what to do. I understand. You are right. After what I have done here, I have no more claim to the title of warrior. Please, do not have them destroy my children. Suddenly, an elemental broke formation and an expert mobility moved in on Ozus and would execute him by laser fire. Shin would be left stunned by the first moment, as Shin thought Ozus assumed the rest of his unit would be executed. Before Shin could dismiss that possibility entirely for how they would never do that, even to the Jaguars, the elemental executed Ozus. To take a moment, what actually occurred here was Ozus was begging the Combine to take him in as bondsman and regain his worth as a warrior. Since no one understood that, or even spoke, Ozus resigned his status as a warrior, and, as a last request, begged the Combine to not let his comrades kill his children. Children, in this case, referring to resulting Sipkos from his genetic legacy, being executed for Ozus' failure. Another mech warrior would take the lead and address the Combine, saying the conditions of the battle will remain even to their chagrin, and offered to execute Ozus's children. Shin would not hesitate to deny further needless executions, and granted the remaining Jaguars leave of Wolcott. Now, the Combine had possession of four clan Omnimex and twelve suits of elemental power armor. October 31st, 3050, aboard the warship Direwolf, a meeting of cons would be beginning soon, as the clan cons were to meet and discuss the state of the invasion in the system of Radstadt, a system they had yet to jump to. The meeting would be about Kleinwolf's exceptional performance compared to the other clans making the Ghost Bears, Jade Falcons, and Smoke Jaguars look pathetic in comparison. No doubt, Ulrich expected to be figuratively leashed as a result of this meeting, but no one had disillusions about Wolf's performance being well earned. It simply came down to Kleinwolf making everyone else look so bad. To further highlight failures, the recent defeats of Clan Jade Falcon and Smoke Jaguar at the hands of FedCom and Combine forces respectively, definitely had tensions extremely high among the clans. Phelan would enter the observation deck overlooking the bridge to find Folkt already occupying the space. Before Phelan excused himself, Folkt said he was actually looking for him specifically, since Ilkhan Leo Showers objected to Precentor Marshall's presence on the bridge. Folkt would tip his hand more directly to Phelan, saying he would give much to learn the goal of the invasion. This made Phelan concerned. Surely enough, Folkt was probing Phelan for any knowledge about the clans even Folkt would fail to excavate, as Phelan had been around more critical military operations than him, even as a bondsman. The two would guess at why Ulrich kept Folkt and Phelan around considering how large threats they are to the clans, but only theories could be named with no definitive answer. Folkt would admit that Ulrich plays politics far better than anyone he encountered, impressed that Ulrich has hidden all obvious goals of the clans from him, despite all the free access he has given him. Phelan would mention that such prodding of theories would only lead in circles, and even if they could, they had no means to sneak around or access areas without clearance. However, Folkt would say he knew about Phelan's special lockpick. Folkt would press hard, attempting to coerce Phelan into helping him figure out the clan's true intentions, 
but Phelan would recite he made an oath to Ulrich to not divulge information to outside sources, including Vogt and Comstar. Vogt went as far as to say that if Phelan gave him the lockpick, he would say he stole it and keep Phelan's involvement completely on Vogt's shoulders and extended an offer to get word to Phelan's family about his survival. As the warship prepared to jump to Radstadt, the two men would buckle themselves in for the jump, and Folk continued to offer things in front of Phelan to secure his help. Phelan would return Folk's words to him by saying Ulrich is not the only one who plays the political game well. However, that comment evoked an interesting response of honesty from the precentor marshal. Folk admitted that the Primus ordered him to use that level of coercion, as the goals of the clans was highly important to Comstar, and Phelan accurately guessed that if he agreed, such a message would never reach his family. Folkt would resort to kinder methods of persuasion, mentioning that if he figures out what the clans want from the inner sphere, that appeasing or defeating them will be possible. Phelan molded over in his head and finally relented to help Folkt, but not at the moment, as the extra security and watchful eyes with all the clans present would be impossible to get around. However, Phelan's thought process would be an interesting one. Could it be that the Khan has thrown us together so we discover secrets about the clans that could aid our own people? He's given me almost as much information as Justin Aller carried away from the Capellan Confederation in the Fourth War. Could Ulrich be secretly working against a war he does not believe is right? And if so, are the two of us his tools for getting that information to the successor states? The Direwolf would then make the jump to Radstadt, however, along with all other clan jump ships coming with, there was more than Phelan originally counted. Alarm sounded as a fleet battle began upon their arrival with Rossel Hagen forces, specifically the first Dracons. Engaging with their arrow fighter wing, Tyra Miraborg used her Shylone fighter for all it's worth, but took a big hit from a battle mech that used the warship's hull as a firing platform, and all but completely maimed her Shylone. In a last ditch effort, she would mutter that she would finally get to join Phelan Kell and sent her Shylone on a kamikaze course right for the bridge of the direwolf. Phelan and Folkt would be rushing to the bridge as the ship was hit which knocked out their escort. Phelan was in damage control mode and in the most Phelan way took charge of the situation. Using his downed escort's radio he would order a response team and medical to the bridge which elicited a welcoming response from the operator on the other end regardless of identity called Phelan commander. In that moment the meritocratic society the clans ran became apparent to Phelan, as the ability mattered just as much as who, but in cases of crisis, those who had the ability to command were looked up to, and right now, that was Phelan's position to the first responders around him. Phelan would see the damage control team arrive and be told the door to the bridge suffered an electronic failure and the access code reset. The tech would say nine digits would be the new code but impossible to crack since the code reset itself to something random. Phelan handed his lockpick to the tech for him to access the door and quickly told him how to use it. He then donned one of the EVA suits the team brought, to which Phelan would enter the Phelan integrity of the bridge first and prioritize rescuing the Ilkhan and Khan Ulrich, then others after they were evacuated. Phelan and a small team of rescuers entered the ruined bridge and would notice the level of destruction was on par with something big impacting the bridge, or something fast, but there were no traces of what. A black gooey film kept the vacuum of space at bay but was straining heavily at the large hole it had to cover and meant the time for rescuing anyone was short. Phelan managed to find Khan Ulrich buried under debris but faintly alive. Providing oxygen from the spare tanks on the EVA suit, Ulrich awoke enough to not be completely dead weight but needed Phelan's assistance to move and stand. As a pair of techs came over to Phelan, he would order them to evacuate the Khan while he stayed and searched for the Ilkhan. Phelan would be running out of time as the tech would be yelling at him to get off the bridge as the safety seal was beyond safe stress levels and would let go any second. On his way out, Phelan noticed slight movement from a body under some metal. It was Vlad. After freeing the unconscious pain in the ass from the debris, literally hauling him by the very belt buckle Tyra Miraborg made him, that Vlad claimed as his own, towards the door. Reaching imminent seal failure, Phelan heaved Vlad over his shoulder and would make a dash for the door but slipped on a pool of blood. Luckily, Vlad's unconscious body landed close enough to the door where people were waiting to pull him in. As the seal gave way, Phelan felt himself being slowly sucked backwards towards the breach, but the last moment, 
An elemental in full armor appeared and grabbed Phelan just in time as the door snapped shut behind them as the seal broke. Phelan got up and offered his hand to the elemental. I don't know how I can ever thank you. The elemental removed the helmet to reveal the figure was Avantha. It would have been a waste to let you die. Avantha? After what I did on Rosselhog, why? You may be a bondsman, Phelan Patrick Kell, but you have a warrior's heart. You have much to learn about us and our ways, but you should realize that we respect you. To let you die needlessly would have been a greater sin than letting you defeat me. And it would have prevented me from having the chance to fight you again. In the aftermath of this first act, the forces of the Federated Commonwealth that fought the Jade Falcons on Twycross returned to Tharkad, Kai deciding to stay enlisted coming to terms that, if anything, for him to personally make up for the failings he committed on Twycross, he needed the opportunity to be better. More so, the unending flood of soldiers present and not present at the Gash would thank Kai for saving them from death, and it made Kai feel like he was his own person, a small gesture that made him feel at least a bit more comfortable with what he did. Everyone else saw what he did as a miracle, where Kai, as always, was thinking how he could have done better with fewer losses. Victor had only a moment to celebrate Kai choosing to stick around when the arrival of his mother, Archon Melissa Steiner Davion, Morgan Hasek Davion, and a person Victor didn't recognize but recognized the uniform. A representative from Wolf's Dragoon showed up to take Victor, Galen, Kai, Melissa, and Morgan to a strategy meeting on outreach. He would further warn that if something does not come of this, that there would be nothing in the inner sphere that could stop the clans. Meanwhile, on Luthien, the capital of the Draconis Combine, Shin Yodama would be going to meet Theodore Kurita, only to be interrupted by an unknown interloper in which Shin engaged hand to hand in. However, it was clear the interloper was testing Shin, and sure enough, they were. Revealing to be a representative from Wolf's Dragoons, would Theodore, Shin, and Hohiro be invited to outreach for a strategy meeting, indicating a similar gravity to the coming events as their FedCom counterparts? Given the fact of extreme discourse between the Combine and the Wolf's Dragoons, Theodore was standoffish until the reality of events set in. After some time, all would meet on outreach, even including the other prominent nobles from the Great Houses, and even the Kellhounds, including Morgan Kell. The mixing pot of rival politics between the Great Houses was dangerous, but all had an inkling that such a meeting would not occur if Colonel Jamie Wolfe of the Wolf's Dragoons hadn't personally invited each and every one of them here to outreach. However, one arrival did collectively set everyone on edge. The arrival of Chancellor Romano Liao of the Capelling Confederation and her son, Sun Tzu Liao. While it's easy to make fun of and poke at the eternal bad guys the Capellans are, we will look more into them in the next act of the clan invasion. For now, just be aware that there is more to them than first appears. Before further commotion could begin, attentions were shifted to the filtering in of various high command staff of the Wolf's Dragoons, including Jamie Wolf himself. However, it would strike Victor as odd that the legendary Black Widow, Natasha Kerensky, was not anywhere to be seen. Jamie would announce a shift in command before beginning, revealing Major Darnell Winningham as actually being Mackenzie Wolf, Jamie's son, would be taking Natasha's place in the Dragoons. Jamie would begin by recapping the events that led them here, stating a superior force has had the entire inner sphere under siege for the better part of a year, only to find themselves in a lull of the war, as the clan seemingly have halted their invasion entirely. A voice in the crowd, not Liao, would improperly assume that the answer was because the inner sphere began to see victories against the clans, but Jamie would remind them all that sheer luck and loopholes only work once, and the defeats handed to the clans was hardly a dent in their armor. The inner sphere was well out of its depth, and if they were to have any chance of surviving, the great houses and mercenaries would have to band together. Of course, Romano Liao would accuse Jamie of waiting out the war for the Great Houses to soften the invaders for the Dragoons to emerge and win the day. However, Jamie would go on to do his best to make Romano realize how wrong and dire the situation was. I am afraid you have it all wrong, Madam Chancellor. The enemy we face is not composed of either renegades or bandits. The invaders will be back, probably in less than a year. We will have to be ready to meet them with everything we've got, because we've seen only a small sample of their strength. 
after Radstadt and after the death of their war leader, they'll come at us at full strength. They'll ask no quarter and grant none. Ladies and gentlemen, now begins what could easily be the last days of the Inner Sphere. Phelan would catch the pre-centaur marshal as he was departing the direwolf, headed back to Terra and Comstar, as Ulrich deemed it highly unsafe for Folkt to come with wherever the clans were now going. Folkt would ask if anything became of Phelan's breach of command structure during the crisis at Radstadt, but Phelan told him that they've practically given him the cold shoulder since, but chalked it up to that more pressing matters had to be handled first. Both would state the Jaguars' anger towards Phelan and the Inner Sphere as they saw both guilty for the Ilkhan's death, an Ilkhan that was from their clan. They would say their goodbyes as Folk departed on a shuttle outbound for a Comstar jump ship nearby. Phelan wouldn't have much time to reflect as two elementals in full armor sporting the colors of Clan Smoke Jaguar approached Phelan demanding him to follow them. Joined by a third Jaguar elemental in the elevator, Phelan would realize that they were taking him to a deck on the direwolf reserved for warriors only. They'd lead him further into the ship, stopping at an unmarked door. One of the elementals would shove him inside the dark room, the door closing immediately after, leaving him seemingly alone in darkness. Suddenly, a door impossible to see hissed open, as a figure dressed in opulent and intricate clothing appeared in a mask resembling the totem animal of the clan. In an elaborate induction ceremony, Phelan would experience the unique ritual, noting members from the other three clans taking part, specifically Lincoln Ozas of Clan Smoke Jaguar. However, the real shocker for Phelan would be who stood up for him in the last part of the ritual. The unmistakable symbol on the masked woman's abdomen Phelan noticed the moment the woman removed her mask. I recognize thee, Natasha Kerensky, of the wolves. As soon as Phelan asked himself why the Black Widow was here, the answer hit him like an AC-20. Oh my god, they're not the Wolf Dragoons, they're THE Wolf Dragoons! They've been part of the clans all along! Ulrich would then cut Phelan's bond cord with ceremonial words, handing the knife he did so with to Phelan, welcoming Phelan as a member of Clan Wolf. In further interesting events, Vlad revealing himself to be one of the many masked ceremonial warriors of the ritual, would very bitterly say, Welcome, Bloodkin, to the House of Ward. Finally, the last piece of the name puzzle would click into place. I, Ulrich Kerensky, Khan of the Wolves and Oathmaster of this conclave, do welcome you, Phelan Patrick Kell, to the Clan of the Wolves. According to custom handed down since Alexander Kerensky led our forefathers from this place and his son, Nicholas, saved us from ourselves, you will be known to the children of Kerensky as Phelan Wolf. All are to abide by the reed given here. Thus shall it stand until we all shall fall. Yes, that's right. While I like sneakily alluding to the obvious, the revelation of that speech alone is reality shattering. The clans are the Star League returned, but not as anyone expected. On top of that, but the Kerensky name runs strong in its leaders, further impressing upon Phelan the situation he was now in. But none of it bothered him. If anything, something he did not know was missing finally clicked into place. Phelan would have many questions about all that happened, stating he still had much to learn about the clans. Ulrich promised answers once the journey was complete. Phelan would ask what journey he meant, to which Ulrich Kerensky responded with this. We will travel to where the clans all the clans, must meet to discuss what we have done. We will elect a new Ilkhan and review our successes and failures. Then, under the leadership of the new Ilkhan, we will return to the Inner Sphere and complete the liberation of the Star League from the forces that destroyed it three centuries ago.
ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of part one of three for the client invasion series. Normally, my thoughts and comments about the process are talked about here, but considering this video was meant to be one long chunk, having them appear here doesn't make much sense, so I'll leave those comments for the end of the third video. For now, I hope you enjoyed the first part and look forward to seeing you for the next part very soon. Given the release day of this video, I wish you all a happy holiday season full of joy and good food. Take care, everyone.